my service off the record. Oops. We highly recommend it. I believe in compulsory military training. Days in Hicksville, New York, 25th of June, 2003, 10 a.m. The interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Thomas William McCutcheon, born in Brooklyn, New York, August 26, 1919. What was your educational background prior to entering military service? Just elementary school. Okay. Um, do you remember where you were and what your reaction was to Pearl Harbor when you heard about the news of I was bombing? In, I was in Camp Shelby. We were all very shocked because we were due to be discharged at the seven one year. Mm -hmm. And that was extended to indefinitely on discharge. Mm -hmm. We were shocked and couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, were you drafted or did you enlist in no. the Army? I was in the National Guard four years before. Okay. Um, so why were you in uh, Camp Shelby? Well, we were mobilized. Originally, the unit I was with was with the 14th Infantry in Brooklyn and the 3rd Battalion. So the 3rd Battalion, which consisted of four companies, one Flushing I Company, KL and M in Hempstead, New York. We were taken out of that regiment and made a 102nd anti-tank. We were mobilized in October and we federalized January 13th and left for Shelby, Mississippi. Uh, why did you join the uh, National Guard? Well, I was fascinated by the dress uniform. And I thought it was a good thing. Mm -hmm. I was 17 years old. And I, I got quite a bit out of it. Very interested in the military. Mm -hmm. Had your family had much military tradition? No, no, oh. none at all. So it was just you were, you were interested? Yes. Okay. Um, all right, so what, what was your reaction when you found out that you were federalized? You well, I looked forward to it because I liked the military. And I was 21 at the time, so I just really was interested in going away. You can't say why or what not, but mm -hmm. it was only supposed to be for a year. But uh, I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Um, were you given any additional training uh, after you were federalized? Oh yes. Well, we, we were, when we were federalized, we were designated as a 102nd anti-tank. And of course we had to get educated on that part. And uh, then from right after Pearl Harbor, we were made tank destroyers, which meant heavier equipment. And the military realized that the type of work that we were doing at that time wasn't strong enough. So we got heavier, we heavier weapons. Mm -hmm. Is this, uh, what, did you go right into the 802nd anti-tank, or tank destroyer unit? Yeah, just by changing name mm -hmm. and training of heavier equipment. Okay. Uh, where was the the camp for the 802nd? Was that in Mississippi also? Yes, uh, near, near uh, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Okay. Uh, what kind of equipment did you receive and how was it different? Well, I don't know. It. We had no equipment. Just everything was simulated. Uh -huh. We were poorly equipped. I don't know if we should go any further. Okay. Uh, it took us a while to get equipment. Uh -huh. we, when we first started, I guess it was about a year and a half, we got one piece at a time, you know, and they were 37 millimeter guns, which was ridiculous. Then we went to the half track with a French 75 on it, also ridiculous. Very poor maneuverability. Then we got the M10 tank, which had a uh, three-inch gun on it, which was halfway decent. 
And we also uh, had a toad gun, a three inch toad gun, in between the actors, which we really uh, experimenting with. And when, well, should I go any further? It's up to you. Well, when we went overseas, We had, well, of course, we left this country without any equipment. We were supposed to pick it up over there. Mm -hmm. Now, when did you leave? We left uh, April. I say the first, but uh, reports contradict, which uh, I don't know why, but uh, they say it was about the 6th or the 10th of April, or after battle reports. And, I uh -huh. have. and when we got to England, we went to... Uh, we landed. Now, this was 44? Forty-four. Okay. Now, am I jumping anything? No, no. Uh, we landed in Scotland, Glasgow. Went down to England to a town, a camp that was built around a sand pit called Cheshire. And then we got worried that we were going to go overseas uh, into France. And they had no M10 tanks, which we trained on for a while. So for almost a year, so they substitu substituted weapons for us, which was a towed three-inch gun. So we had a quick retrain for that again, which we had some experience in the state with it. And we went over with the uh, towed guns. And then later on we had gotten heavier weapons, which maybe I'll cover later. But okay. We, I do like to say, for the record, that it, well, I can see it'll never happen again. We were very uh, poorly equipped, very poorly. I'd like to emphasize that fact, because I was in supply. I was company supply sergeant at that time, and it used to aggravate me not being able to get. I'm talking in the early years, equipment, which we had men leave here in New York not even dressed properly. And uh, when we got down to Shelby, best we could get, we even had English infield rifles. What kind of helmets did you have? Did you have the old we, World War One style helmet? We left with that, but mm -hmm. uh, I, th I would say we got the other ones very, very quick. And they were, they, they were great because we had the, uh, the liners that we used as like a pit helmet, you mm -hmm. know, we were fragments, and they were, they were very good. But what I want to emphasize the fact is the type of weapons that they gave us was very poorly. No research was ever done on it, from my knowledge. And not that it was a smart aleck, I don't mean it that way, but uh, I knew about weapons with the training in the National Guard because I was artificer. I don't know if the word is still carried on today or if you're familiar with it, but that's actually a gun mechanic. Mm -hmm. So that's how from there on I, I uh, became sergeant and supply sergeant. But uh, it, took, it took us a long time to get organized. And we were, we were alerted one time to go to the Pacific, but we had no equipment. And then when we did get it, it, it was fast and hard training. But we had a good bunch of men, I highly praise and our first draft were excellent men. And after after a year, I became staff sergeant in supply. And of course, when on the other side, I became first sergeant in a reconnaissance company. And by that, by that time, they gave us what they called the M36 weapon, which was much bigger than the M10, and really the only one that could really knock a Panzer tank out, because that had a, a 90 millimeter gun, which was excellent. What I'm driving is it took the country four years to come out with a weapon like that that could knock on. And they had plenty of experience in Africa with the M10s they should have, with the, uh, uh, the, the, the half tracks with the 75s mm -hmm. because they dug right into the sand and couldn't move. And these stories we were getting back because we would send cadres out of our unit because uh, Tank Destroyer became very popular in '42. They realized that they needed a more of the experience going on in Africa. And the M10, which they had and shipped over with the tank destroyers, was ridiculous. And you'd get these stories back from fellows that left, you know, 
contact of each other through mail. It, it, it was sad, sad. But when they came, finally came out with the M36, which they should have had, it, it was a, a, a good challenge. Mm -hmm. I'd like to emphasize that fact mm -hmm. because I don't think we'd ever be caught in a position like that again, though. But I, I think of all the units, the Air Corps and, and the tank destroyers that they were trying to build up suffered the most with getting equipment. But when it did come, it, it, it was great. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wish I knew how to... I'm jumping back and forth. I no, that, I, that's fine. No, I don't. I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to emphasize one big fact. When the war was over in Europe, would you, is it all right to go on with that sure. part now? Uh, when we were, right before we were setting up military government, we had picked up a German co uh, colonel. And uh, after the war we were seeing who was around, which is one of the forces that's over there in Iraq today. We, we had to go and any weapons that was around or whatnot, and, and military that had deserted, we would bring them in. Well, we picked up this colonel, and, and uh, we got talking. And uh, he, he said to me, I said to him, what do you think of our, our men, you know? He thought we were great. And one thing he could not get over it, and I had seen this incident where we had five tanks in a row knocked out, which they caught the first, the second, third, fourth, fifth up the row. He says he was fascinated. The next day when he saw 12 tanks come through the same area, he says our mass production must, must have been out of this world, which at that time, yes, it was. And that's one reason why we were able to win. Our men were good. They weren't the best soldier, but they were good. And our equipment at that time, after five, almost five years, it was excellent. Okay. Um, were you involved in the D-Day landings? No. We went in, I, I say, the, the, the 13th, but our, if the battle reports say a later date, mm -hmm. I think it was about June 24th, I think they say. But we landed at Utah, and uh, in the hedgerow of Carrington, we went through. And uh, the only thing there was... The, the dead animals and still picking up wounded soldiers at that late date. Mm -hmm. And then we moved on to uh, St. Malo in that area. When uh, was your first uh, combat experience? Well, I'd say the first night we were landed. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, it's a tough thing to explain. Uh, about combat. You don't really want know what it is until you hear it. Mm -hmm. And my, my, my funny story is, uh, I, I often tell, is when we were at Stonehenge and they were making the landing, there were so many planes flying overhead that the ground shook, which was amazing. Then is when you start to realize something's going on. I mean, I never pictured what it would be like in, in Europe and France. But I started to get the feeling when the planes went over and the ground shook, there were so many of them. Then we got down to the port of debarkation. I carried a pistol. And I said, to, I mean, I, being a supply sergeant, I never knew what, was going, what my job would be on the other side, actually. So I went up to the first sergeant, John Raker, who was a good friend of mine. He served in the Marine Corps eight years before he joined the National Guard with us. And he had experience because he was uh, in two Yangtze campaigns in China. And uh, I went up to him, I said, John, you know, we're both carrying pistols. Uh, they're not going to be any good for us in combat. So I had a good friend in battalion supply, Bill Hanley, and I had asked him with two rifles, you know, for John and I. Well, I landed with a rifle, which was a nuisance. But there was no, we had no, no combat in the, uh, the first day at all. Mm -hmm. Because we landed the beach, the beach was already cleared, good. We went into the, to the hedgerows. And that first night, when I realized what war was like, was the sound in the distance of the shoveling and uh, 
rifle fire you could hear and so forth, then you wonder. Uh, I couldn't explain it, but it's frightening. But it just you had to go on. So we, we got out of that area. And my, my experience, which I, I never knew whether, what it, uh, whether it was necessary or not, but I'd, I, I was on the front line every day to visit the guys if they needed anything, gasoline, ammunition, and the biggest, well, later on, the biggest problem was stockings, keeping their feet dry and whatnot. But I was on the front line every day, and many a day I didn't know what prayer to say next. I had no jeep. I had a good friend who had the third platoon, Nick Wakerich. He was staff sergeant and uh, he used to take me around with his jeep. We had time and I, I, he, he was a good help to me. And we had to get out. Many a times I was frightened, laying on the side of the road. They were, spotted us traveling. And uh, like I said, I didn't know what prayer to say. But we got out of it all right. So then we go on with the story. Well, our mission at that time was mostly knocking down church steeples and knocking out pillboxes. There was no tanks in the area. But for the infantry's sake, the steeples and the churches were all knocked off. See, a tank destroyer weapon is a very strong, hey, this was a tow gun three inch that we had at the time. They were flat projectory and you could get a good shot, a good straight shot, you never missed. And that was our job mostly before the infantry would come and knock out pillboxes and, you know, of course if we saw any tanks they had to go out. But actually that was not my end of the work. But I, <coughs> I saw this all being done. Why did you knock off church steeples? They kind of snipers mm -hmm. and observation towers. They, everyone was used. Everyone. It was a sin to knock them off, but uh, how to be done? Uh, I don't know if you want any further information on that. Well, uh, you know, any additional information you have of your experience? Oh, well, I, I, I can go on for hours. <laughs> uh, our biggest, our biggest uh, venture, I guess, was uh, getting into St. Malo. Uh, it's a, it was a beautiful area, which I can tell later on. I went back at the 50th anniversary. Uh, it was a big citadel there. It was built back in about 1400. That was knocked down right to the ground. Uh, it never was mentioned that I know of who did it, the Germans or us. But outside of St. Malo, there was an island called Zazamba. And our, our mission after the town, the company that I was with, the, the, in St. Malo, the, the uh, o ocean goes right up quite a bit for about a mile. And on both sides, of one side is St. Malo, the other side is Denard. Well, we were on the St. Malo side, and uh, this island, we had a knock, there was a big railroad gun on this island. So our guns were trained every minute to fire one shot from each gun, one shot a minute, to knock that uh, railroad gun out. So we thought we had it after a couple of days of uh, firing at it. And we went back to a rest area up at uh, Tours, which is about 30 or 40 miles south of Paris. That was the first rest area we were going to get. We were up there a couple of days and we called back. The Free French couldn't hold it anymore. We were still firing again. And this gun, I don't know, there was two on the island or one on the island. But one faced the ocean and one face, uh, faced the land. So they were going to make St. Malo a harbor for supplies coming in from uh, this country. And the ship, they, they hit the ship and sunk it. So we had to go back and go after it and stay there to make sure it was really cleaned up. So uh, we did. We couldn't do much good with the guns, and they brought the Air Force in. And I'll never forget it. Uh, the Air Force didn't do too much earlier, and then the English came in with uh, P-38s and dropped gas, gasoline. That actually did it. 
they uh, all came out and on the land and I watched them parade down the street. There was at least uh, 200 Germans that were on that island and I would say 50 or 75 French women, which the French lady is to me, said it was not so they weren't French, but so help me God they were French women. And that was quite a feeling. I mean, I, I, I would honestly say, like I wasn't actually a combat soldier, I felt that we accomplished something big. You feel pride, it's a strange feeling. So then we went, we went on up into France, and then over to Luxembourg. We got into Luxembourg in the beginning of September. And uh, all we did in Luxembourg was maintain the front line. We had uh, several casualties. <coughs> and we stood in Luxembourg till after the breakthrough. The breakthrough started, to my knowledge, about December 21st. And our unit was supposed to go up to the Ardennes Forest, which at this time we were still towed guns. And I remember I, 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 we were reorganizing the battalion about that time to go back to the towed guns, uh, the, the self-propelled guns, which were the M36s in, in the later part of September, but it never transacted due to the, uh, the breakthrough coming through. So we were supposed to go up to the Ardennes Forest, and our colonel come back and said that we can't, we can't move with towed guns up to that area. So another outfit that was self-propelled went up and they were completely wiped out. So we had an awful lot of blessing with us all the way through. Then we moved on. We had to go up into Holland, which our after battle reports don't remember, but we, we spent some time attached to the British 21st Army. I don't know why it's not recorded. And uh, we stood there in Holland cleaning up pockets that behind. Then we went on into, after that we went on into Germany and until the war ended we fought right through. We were finished up in Czechoslovakia, Prague, Czechoslovakia. We met the Russians there and that was pretty quiet. We had a little t trouble at the buffer state. It was a mile between us and the Russians. It used to annoy the hell out of me. At this time I was already first sergeant. And uh, both our troops would sneak over there and their troops, and it was a big thing of uh, exchanging them. And they were not nice, very not nice at all. My, my biggest disappointing with them was I thought their hygiene habits were terrible, which ours and our soldiers were always good and clean. Good and clean, I would honestly say that. Because we had mobile showers and stuff and all like that there. Yeah. So then the war was all over. But the reports, I was very, very disturbed over there at the time when I had heard I had gotten mail from uh, fellows that had been with us, went, went to other outfits where they had to stay and uh, wait till the Russians got into to, to Berlin. I think that was the biggest mistake. That hurt me then. Uh, that's about all I, I can say. And then, of course, the redeployment I thought was very poor. I was a high point man. Uh, our redeployment was very poor. I wound up with a, an outfit at 88th Cavalry. And uh, I thought they were very unorganized. But they never did see combat. Incidentally, the 802nd has a record of having more days on the front line than any other Europe, any other unit in Europe. Uh, at uh, redeployment home, I left. I left the 802nd to go to the 88th Cavalry in uh, June, June. The war was over April 12th to 14th, something like that, 20th. But anyway, I didn't get back home until uh, October 15th. Wound up in England processing vehicles for the Pacific. 
with a unit that had about 14, 14 first sergeants, 50 techs, or maybe 20, 25 uh, staffs and bucks and so forth with one private. <laughs> and the funniest, funniest thing, I was with fellas that I served with. The funniest thing is that we had to, we had to organize a company out of this group who called the 701 Tank Battalion, but there was only about 130 of us. And uh, we needed uh, first sergeants, we needed cooks, and we needed supply, and the rest were served as guards. So they needed a, a supply sergeant. So my friend, Leo Krieski, he was acting for his sergeant. He was a master sergeant in S1 section. And uh, put the punch card, we had the punch cards, the uh, 201 files, which was the old automatic, like our computers today. And you put the, the key in the box and pull it up, and whatever you were looking for it was numbered. So would they pick me for a first sergeant? I said, no way, I had enough of it. So I worked there for two months as a private, which was quite a thing, quite a thing. And then we came home on a Liberty ship. I must, I must say this here, though, you know, with, with my military experience, well, I went in as a sergeant, come out as a first sergeant. I only served God one night calling guard duty, and that was December 24th, 1944, Well, the breakthrough was going to everybody, cooks and everybody was on a post, which was my first time. And then coming home with this group, I served as, on KP. So with all my five years, I served guard once and KP once. Now, when you were calling KP, what rank were you at? Voice sergeant. Really? Yeah. So, I mean, they, they, I often talk about that and think about it, you know, it's comical. But uh, I, had, I had to go through uh, the hikes and everything the same as everybody else. Not that I had to, I could always use an excuse, but I took pleasure in doing that. And, of course, uh, it was always a laugh, I'm a cut and I'll never make it, and stuff like that, you know. But that was my challenge. But the 25 mile hike was the big thing, you know. So I made that flying colors, even though I was not in good shape for it. But I got out every morning with the company. I never had to make formations, which would be in supply or something different. It's almost like a cook, you know, you know. And uh, I never made formations in the morning. Because I had my own tent, you know, the equipment and whatnot. In those days, everything had to be under lock and key, weapons and so forth every night. So I had my own tent and I never had to make formations, but uh, for calisthenics and so forth, I fell out. That I figured I had to do. But uh, I enjoyed my military life very much, very much. And I say to this day, I had two sons, but it wouldn't have bothered me if they had to go into service. I believe in compulsory military training. It made a man and an education out of him, gave me an education. And I've made many good friends which, uh, I don't know if you noticed there, I, I was the one that started the 800 Second Tank Destroyer Veterans Association, which is started as, as <coughs> it's uh, chartered by the state of New York. Mm -hmm. but of course, we're very weak today, very weak. We started out with a, uh, well, we had well over a thousand men in the battalion, but we were able to locate at least 800, and we're down now to 127, mm. better either uh, the others only passed away or just we lost track of them. But we send a newsletter out now, it used to be every month, but now it's every two months. We keep intact. Mm -hmm. and they're all wonderful, good people. Good people. Now most of these men, or a large number of these men, were men that you served in the National Guard with. I, I no, no. Initially? No. I, 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 should, I should have said it before, but I don't know. If I'm out of order, I'm, I'm jumping around. Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. When we were mobilized in Flushing in October of 1940, we had 62 men in an infantry company. When we were 
redesignated as 102nd, we had to go up to 102 men. Mm -hmm. So we recruited with the ads, beat the draft, and joined the guard. Mm -hmm. And we were able to pick up 102, up the balance, for let's say 40 men. Mm -hmm. Of course, in the meantime, those three months before, like, well, men had to go to school that were special. Like, I had to go to school for three months, a couple of nights a week to learn military law and handling supply and the different forms and stuff like that. Miss Sergeant had to go. And, and new men, they had the 10 series in those days. I don't know what they got today. A man would take, like, a home correspondent course to be an officer. Of course, we had uh, three men at the time that had to, had to go to the school, too, and that was all part of his 10 series became officer. That's how I became first sergeant. My sergeant, when I was a gun mechanic, became an officer, so they put me in his place and they made me so. So uh, then we went away with 102 men in January 41, and we needed 164 men. So we got them from the first draft from New York, which a great number of them came from the Bronx, and up in your area, upstate, uh, Frankfurt, Utica, mm -hmm. quite a few. Uh, we got the balance of the 40 men from the first draft. And of course, then we had to go, they had to be trained, uh, their basic three month training. So we set that up. And our unit sent a great number of men that were National Guard men mostly to the infantry training. And then in 42, the Air Force had a big drive. We, sent men to that, and then the TDC sent to the Tight Destroyer Center in Texas opened in 42. We sent men to other, they realized that they needed more Tight Destroyer, we sent. Mm -hmm. So we had, a, we had a constant turnover, and very few that came back home were from the original National Guard. Mm -hmm. Did you, uh, when you uh, left service, did you ever make use of the GI Bill? Just buying the house. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you use the 5220 club at all? For two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's about all. And as far as, uh, to be honest with you, uh, I had no disabilities, thank God. I must say, too, I'm not ashamed of it. Well, I'm getting off the track. I, I uh, went through the whole war without firing a shot. I never had to. Uh, many a time I, I thought I had to, like I mentioned earlier. But I, I do want to go back to when I changed from a pistol to a rifle. A short while after I was in, in, in service, I was at headquarters and they were getting new equipment, replacement equipment. And I spotted in one of the equipment, in one of the vehicles, that they had a brand new Tommy gun. I said, God, that's, that's what I need, rather than a rifle. So I, a good friend Billy gave me anything. Well, I carried that till I became first sergeant, and I turned it back in for the pistol. And uh, I got reprimanded for doing something to the gun. It wouldn't fire. Now, I carried that most of the way through Normandy, France, Germany. It didn't work. And it was my stupidity of not testing it, and I got it but it had a short firing pin. The Tommy gun that were made during the war had a stationary pin in the block, and that was too short, it wouldn't it hit the shot. So, I mean, I had to tell that there, but I know I had a place there, but no. getting back to the GI Bill, no, I, I got nothing to it, but one thing I'm very disappointed on, the Veterans Affair. I, I uh, just, Recently, like I mentioned earlier, the coffee there, that I take 14 pills a day. So, of course, the fellas always hounded me to go to the GI, uh, to the Veterans Affair to get my pills. So I said, ah, no, I, I didn't need it, to be honest with you, because my wife worked in the hospital and I got them for nothing. But when my wife died, I had to go out and get them, and it was running quite a couple hundred dollars a month. So I went to the VA, he agreed to send it to me, but the handling was very poor, I got discussed with him. Number one, they sent it to the wrong address, which was no such street in the town that I live in. 
There was only a miracle about six weeks later I got the package. So I, I, I couldn't afford to go through that. So I uh, get my drugs now through uh, Epic, New York State plan, which I think is very great. And it only costs me about $120 a month. But I'd like to say that, that uh, I think there's a lot of improvement needed in the VA. Thank God I don't need much of it, but I think of the men that do need it. Oh, I did after the war. I went through the VA. I'm very sorry I missed that part. Uh, I uh, had a, I come out of the service with very bad hemorrhoids, internal, external with a tumor. So when I was being examined for discharge, the army said to me, well, I should, uh, I suffered with them all through Europe, and it meant going back to England, which I wouldn't do. I stood and wanted to stay with the outfit, but when I got out, they got worse, and I went to the VA, and uh, I got wonderful care. I went to Kingsbridge Hospital. They did the job good, and then about well, two years later, two and a half years later, I had a, I had a tooth extracted. And the tooth had been taken care of when I was in the military. And it left an, a hole in my mouth, which they call an oral fistula. It left a hole from my mouth to the antrum. It never healed. It was just like a channel. So I went back to the VA because my dentist advised me to. It was a dentist that I went to, and I served with in service also, Paul Caruso, wonderful man. But they, uh, sent me up to Kingsbridge again, and uh, they took care of that. That's the only experience I had with the VA. So you, uh, do, you do you belong to any organ veterans organizations outside of your 802? No, I did for around. a while in the American Legion. That's how I met my wife. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't stay with them long. I had, that was before we had this organization, when I first got married. And I had gotten six or eight men from the 802 to join this one post with us, figuring, well, that was something for us. But uh, we didn't last long. I didn't, uh, well, I was in a poor post, number one. They didn't believe in outsiders, and I was from a different town than they were and whatnot. And we just got annoyed with their attitude. The, the your older fellows from World War I did not accept us too well. Hmm. Now I'm talking about uh, 46, 1946. Mm -hmm. So no, 802 is the original one. Okay. Um, you obviously have stayed in contact with many of the men you served with. Oh, with most of them. Mm -hmm. Most of them. Yes, uh, of course there's not many left today, but uh, I, I've, uh, I don't know, one of the papers I gave you will show that when I was getting discharged, I got the brainstorm of having a veterans organization, and I started it. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, yeah, I saw that. You saw that? You, yes, I don't know. What, do you have our after battle reports? Um, I don't think you gave us that. You gave me the, you sent us the history. Oh, yes, you do, the, the official combat record. Yeah, well, that's, yes. that, that yes. one of our men yes. uh, who was with us, Colonel Harry Hubbard, he went to the Pentagon and got them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, and you, you, do you have the lineage? When we, uh, you gave us the, uh, I'm sure the history of the unit. All right, that's yes. It. Yeah. See now, that, our unit goes back to the Civil War, mm -hmm. which we carry 13 streamers today of all the battles we were in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now you uh, had you brought some things? Would you well, like to show us? Yes, I. It was just uh, well, it, it consists of these are not pictures of. Uh, combat or anything. This, this is what one fellow had, had made up and he had uh, given it to me. I had a name of him tomorrow. See, this was the original 27th insignia. It's mm -hmm. got the insignia and pictures of the weapons that we had. And pictures here. And then there's our insignia, which from the old 14th, but we carried on that same thing. And there's a few stories here about Europe and combat. And then we have here, well, the old old history, the battles that were in the, in the Civil War, World War One, 
in Normandy. We were in the five campaigns in Normandy. I don't know what, what value it is, but what I will say is if you find enough interest in this to put in, this was, uh, which everybody's hounding me today from different organizations that are writing history for this insignia. Somehow or another they got information about it, but it was not official. And we used to wear this insignia on our coveralls. Uh, as a matter of fact, we were one of the first outfits to go into coveralls. We, our, our, our uh, fatigue outfit in those days was dungarees. Mm. And then we went into, we were one of the first to go into a uh, coverall, you know. And we uh, were authorized. For morale purposes, they, uh, they asked for fellas to dream up an insignia as, uh, you know, like they do in, in the Air Corps with the yes. emblem on the plane, yeah. we would have this. Somebody designed it up, I don't know who, but it's become very important with some of the collectors today, they're looking for it. And I get a call, maybe six, seven months from a fellow that's looking for it, which we were not allowed to wear after we had gotten it. You know, when they dropped up the story for morale, or I'd, the unit would be, the army shouldn't care wear it anymore. Because the teacher walk, he did insignias that were dreamt up. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it shows this is uh, after battle report. These, this is the half track. I don't know if you're familiar with any of this stuff, but this, this is the half track that we have with the French mm -hmm. 75. Just uh, hold it up in front you of you, and I can zoom in on it. Okay, I got it. Got it. And then, of course, as we go on here, this this was the three-inch. Uh, and we had this is also this was one of the fellas in the outfit. This was taken in Saint Malo. I remember because uh, this gun, the, the the trail, it's this thing that digs into the ground, mm -hmm. got stuck in trolley tracks, huh. and I had to go out there to, with the artillery to blow it, to get it out. And the only way we figured we could get it out was with dynamite, because it was so wedged in there, trolley track. Huh. So uh, we used what we called in those days a beehive. Instead of blowing up, it blew down. We used to use them to dig holes to put the gun in fast. Mm -hmm. So the, that's how we got that gun out of there. Goodness, I lost the spot. I want to show the other weapons. There's pictures here in combat, but this was the this was the M10 here that that we trained mostly in the States with, but we didn't have that on the other side. We had that towed gun. Can you get it? Yep, I got it. And then, of course, we went into the big, bigger gun. The, M, the tiny one, we didn't have that at all. Yeah, this, this is the M36. That was a 90 millimeter gun. This was, uh, could knock anything out. The only thing that would really one shot marker pins are out. Okay. Yeah. Very now, when was that introduced? Well, we got them. We got them in January of 1945. Hmm. We only had them for three or four months before the war ended. Mm -hmm. But they tried. They started to get them to us in September of 44. But I don't know what happened. We were informed we were going to get them at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. and that there. It's the old M10. There's some, some pictures here of the different vehicles. I don't know if there's any value to you. If I'm authorized to let you have this or the big album, it just, it, it's not too much. You, you've got the... Well, I think something like that would be a great asset to our collection at the museum. Well, maybe, no, I, I think the other collection I got would be better for you. Uh, I have to send something to Camp Shelby. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Due to the distance and cost, I would send, I, I want to favor you fellas because it's New York. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I, no, and you're basically a New York unit. You trace your lineage back to the 14th Brooklyn. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I would rather send, if you, in other words, 
the other collection that way we have is far superior to mm -hmm. this. Now that has the insignias and so on in it also? Well, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of it. You see, what I'm up against is, is getting it to whoever. Yes, yes. And I'm thinking, of course, no, I, I don't know. Say, if I met with you fellas... Uh, well, we're going to be down in a couple of weeks again. Well, I, I would make arrangements somehow or another. You see, I can't buy car, put the... They're in a case. Mm -hmm. Well, we could, wherever it would be, we could even stop at your home and pick them up. If, if that's... Would, or wherever, yes. Well, the, like the day we come in, we... Might as well turn it off. Are we done with the interview? I think, yes, we're done with the interview. We'll, well, that's... Um,